Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Dale. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about Bertrand Russell's essay, The Value of Philosophy. I'm going to talk about three themes from the essay, give you some things to think about, and I'm going to end with several discussion questions that we can talk about later in another forum. You already should have read the essay, and you should have watched my five-minute introduction video as preparation for this lecture. Now, Russell tells us several important things in this essay on the value of philosophy. First, he tells us that philosophy is to be valued for its effects on us, the ones who do philosophy, rather than for its products, for its practical uh, effects or things that it generates. Philosophy is not chiefly valuable because it helps us to get ahead in life. It's valuable for other reasons. Specifically, it's valuable because of the character formation for what it does to help us change and develop as people. I might think of this, for example, in the study of logic. If I study logic purely in order to improve my chess game so that I can become a better chess player, we might say there's an advantage to be had in studying logic for that reason, but it seems that there's also uh, even better reasons for studying logic that are not directly tied to the practical benefit of winning more chess games. The second thing Russell tells us in this essay is that philosophy is a good of the mind, not of the body. And so we are going to find that the goods that philosophy generates for us are not practical goods. They are not goods that can have a cash value that we can trade for in daily life. They don't have an immediate usefulness but that these goods are internal to the self, not external to the self. So the value in doing philosophy is not the bread that it bakes or the good uh, product that it generates, like a kind of technology, but rather the way in which I change by becoming philosophical, by becoming one who philosophizes, who takes a philosophical attitude towards myself and the world. Again, it's character development, not practical, uh, tangible results that constitutes the chief value of philosophy, says Bertrand Russell. Some of these chief values are curiosity about the nature of the universe. It is kept alive and fed by a philosophical attitude. Freedom from prejudice and from selfishness. Uh, think about the way in which the proper study of philosophy, taking a right attitude toward ourselves and the universe, is going to help us to rise up above our own individual concerns and take a kind of global perspective on affairs, to be able to see ourselves in the context of the whole universe, not as one who is simply striving to get ahead at this particular place and time. And the third example that Russell gives of one of these internal goods, one of these goods of the mind, is the ability to escape, he says, the strife of desire and will. Again, this is the constant rat race, the struggle, the desire to seek advantage, to maximize my cash income, to be as productive as possible. Philosophy is a relief from these things. When we do philosophy, we are setting those things aside temporarily in order to engage with something different and perhaps better and more deeply human. So this escape, this peace of mind, escape from desire and strife, is one of these chief internal goods that comes through the proper study and practice of philosophy, according to Bertrand Russell. The third point that Russell makes is in his long section at the end of the essay on philosophical contemplation. Now, philosophical contemplation, he says, is knowing for the sake of knowing. It's a purely disinterested, meaning a, a neutral or non-advantage seeking type of knowing. It is contemplation, as we'll see in the classical sense, in the sense that Aristotle and Aquinas talked about contemplation simply knowing for the sake of knowing, not in order to achieve any sort of advantage for oneself. Russell says that this is a matter of engaging with the world around us in a humble way. There's an important humility involved in philosophic contemplation. Russell says that when the self meets the not-self, okay, when I and my ego encounter the reality of the world around me, Russell says if we are being properly philosophical, we realize that it is it is I who must change. The self must change my opinions and beliefs and values to match the demands that the objective world places upon me. The alternative to this would be a kind of ideological perspective in which the self, with its values and prejudices and preconceived opinions, encounters the real world and demands that the real world be modified and changed 
to match up with the ideological categories that we bring to our encounter with it. A properly philosophical attitude, in Russell's sense, would preclude this kind of ideological domination of the real. There's a sense then in which, for Russell, when we come into contact with the real world, we are being humble and being receptive and open to what reality is telling us. We are adapting our knowledge and our beliefs to match what we find in reality. This is, I think, is part of the source of that peace that he was speaking about. When we adapt ourselves to the world, we uh, achieve a kind of tranquility and a kind of unity with the world. So Russell says this is a kind of expansion of the self. It allows me to think, as it were, with a mind that is larger than my own. It allows me to exceed the boundaries of my own selfish ambition to uh, think as uh, a human being can think at his highest, at, at, as humanity can think at its highest and best in encountering reality. A couple of questions for discussion to leave you with. First, is Russell correct? Is he correct in identifying philosophy as one of these disciplines or practices which is not valuable for its utility or its contribution to our immediate material well-being, but for its formation of our character? Second question, what's the proper mix of useful and non-useful knowledge? How much of my overall time, which is quite limited, should I be spending on doing this kind of philosophy? Uh, should the split be 70-30? Should it be 90-10? Is there some minimum level that everybody should spend in terms of their time and work and investment on this kind of philosophical reflection and encounter with the world, separating it from their overall attitude towards uh, building up the usefulness and, and productivity of their own life. Third question, are there other types of activities, intellectual activities or cultural activities that are not strictly useful but which are valuable nevertheless precisely because they stand outside of the buying and selling matrix of utilitarian economic advantage calculation. I can suggest a couple of these, drawing on the philosopher Joseph Pieper. Uh, prayer and worship, any kind of encounter with the divine. Typically, we do not think of these things in terms of the material advantage they give us. Also, love and art or beauty and death. Think of the rituals surrounding the death of a loved one. There are things that we do and don't do, things that we say and don't say when we are in the presence of death. And this, these things do not seem to be strictly dictated by utility and by usefulness. So if somebody were to say, well, when I die, just bury me in the backyard as fertilizer for the flowers, we know in, in a sense that this is not correct. And it's, it's not the correct way to treat a dead human body, not simply because it's not the most useful way. It might, in fact, be useful. And it's not the incorrect way to treat a human body simply because it might be a public health hazard if people were to bury bodies in their backyard but simply because there's a way in which this, this particular place and time is not a place and time in which we should be making calculations of maximum utility and following out what is most useful for ourselves individually or collectively. There's something about death that commands us to pause and step outside of that type of calculative thinking. In a similar way, if someone were, th someone were to think about art in a purely instrumental way. If they were to think, well, this art is a valuable addition to my investment portfolio, so I will buy it, intending to sell it five years from now at a profit, we would say, that's all well and good, and I'm glad you're supporting the arts, but there's something about art that you're missing with that attitude. Something about the value of art and the way it speaks to us as human beings seems to be lost if you are doing a purely economic calculation about the value of art we would say that type of calculation ought to be mixed with some other type of value judgment about art in order to get the full experience of what art is. And just to give another example, if we think of prayer and worship in an instrumental way, if my atheist friend were to say to me, well, why don't you pray uh, in order to achieve uh, some kind of shortening of your illness or relief from pain? And I would say, the difficulty there is that if I'm praying solely in order to get the advantage of healing from an illness, I'm going about prayer in entirely the wrong way. Prayer is not that kind of thing. It can have a positive effect on my health, and God might in fact heal me or shorten my suffering or relieve me in some way, but I can't 
come at it with a utilitarian attitude that I'm going to pray in order to attain that benefit. My attitude toward God and my asking for healing has to be very different from that type of calculation. Exactly how it's different is, is a subject we can talk about, perhaps, in another forum. Final question. What practical steps can we take to help us not to forget about philosophy or prayer, art, beauty, love, these other uh, practices which help to take us outside of the matrix of economic and utilitarian calculation? What can I do in my own life to help to remind me to take a step back occasionally to think about these transcendent practices and transcendent values that go beyond the workday world and the uh, con um, contest for practical advantage? One suggestion I can make in this regard comes again from the world of religion, and it's the institution of the Sabbath. Think about why it is that many religions celebrate a Sabbath day, a day on which no practical work is to be done. The reason for this uh, is to help to set boundaries to the world of practical economic advantage seeking and to remind people that there is a day set aside solely for engagement with, thought about, relationship with, and prayer and worship directed toward a divine being, something that stands outside of this economic advantage seeking. Looked at purely from a practical economic standpoint, the Sabbath looks like a dead loss. Its value doesn't come in the economic realm, it comes in some other realm. That realm also is where the chief value of philosophy is to be found, according to Bertrand Russell. So that's the end of my lecture on Bertrand Russell. I hope you found some things to think about. I'll enjoy talking with you about this essay in the near future. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.